thank you again, Isabella, very much for all these. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today. And thanks to all the participants for staying until the very end. I know it's been two uh, long and very exciting uh, days. And thanks for inviting me, the, uh, the organizers. And let me just start my screen share. Okay. And so my name is Bella Goddard, and I'm a research fellow at the UCL Institute of Education in, in London. And, and I'll be bringing to our uh, discussions about critical pedagogy, a, a sociology of education perspective, uh, which I can hope and complement some of the discussions that we've already had to help us think about how we can um, challenge um, the dominant power relations and injustices in science education and in science um, participation. So it's gonna be three parts to my talk. I'll start by giving a brief background um, about the research on inequalities in science participation, um, which was based in the UK and presents some um, key findings around um, the concept of science capital. Um, and I'll then uh, talk about two practical tools and approaches that we have, we have co-produced with teachers and with informal STEM learning practitioners to help them um, think about what equitable practice is and apply it in their, in their context. Um, the work that I'll be talking about was um, mostly done in the UK, but the approaches have been adopted internationally to date, mostly in the global north, a lot in Europe, in the US, um, but there's at the moment discussion to um, adopt science capital teaching approach in India, and there have been individuals that we know have, have been adopting it in other contexts um, as, as well, just not to such an extent. Um, this is just really to quickly show uh, some of the projects that I will be drawing on in my, in my talk. So for the background at the beginning, um, I'll draw on a um, now 13 year Aspire study. Um, this is a project led by um, Professor Louise Archer and I've worked on a couple of different ones over the year. Um, so the Aspire's project looked at young people's aspirations in relation to science, what they are, how they develop, and what are the influences um, of them. And then um, the science capital teaching approach was developed as part of the um, two research and development projects, the enterprising science, and now um, extending to um, primary science capital project, where we work with, um, I think in total over 60 teachers who um, were involved in co-producing the approach. And the compass was developed in youth equity and STEM project which works with informal STEM learning um, educators in the UK and in the US. So on to my first part of a talk, just to give a little bit of a context then for the tools that I'll be talking about. Um, so at the heart of our project are concerns with inequalities in science education, which are a social justice concern. And we know that in many countries around the globe, um, the concerns about who, tends to go into um, higher education in these subjects, as well as um, jobs in, in this um, area. And often the demographics are very narrow across gender, ethnicity, and socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, in the UK and um, similar countries, it tend to be, a lot of the subjects tend to be dominated by white, male, middle-class, able-bodied individuals. I also wanna highlight here that the concern of this project isn't just pipeline, but really the broader engagement and how to use STEM in, in, in own lives. And a lot of the approaches have very much focused on making science more interesting, making science more fun, and have often developed what we call like deficit approaches, really thinking that there's a lack in certain individuals. They're not interested enough. They don't know enough. And if we fix that, then they'll participate in science. Um, but our research suggests that lack of interest isn't the main issues. And there's a lot of ways in, way, um, in how education plays a role in excluding some students from science. 
Um, so just to quickly highlight a few of the um, findings from the Aspire study, um, our surveys found that young people like science, but few aspire to be scientists. So actually interest is quite high across different age groups. Uh, young people think they learn interesting things, they value the work the scientists do, but they don't see themselves going into these disciplines. Um, what do they aspire to do? Um, business tend to be consistently most popular, and you see that scientists is, is somewhere quite a bit further, further down. Um, one of the factors, one of the many factors shaping um, aspirations and uh, our representations of this subject as clever and male, um, especially physics, is deemed by young people as for the select few um, who are male and brainy. And often even teachers we found have been reinforcing these stereotypes, thinking, saying that you need a boy brain to go into physics um, in the UK. And, and that sort of view was present even in some all girls school that some of my colleagues have spoken to. And young people also get differential support for pursuing science further. And um, the Aspire study found that boys and students with high cultural capitals so from more privileged backgrounds were statistically more likely to report receiving encouragement from teachers to continue with this subject. Um, so as a result, um, there's a process that we call weeding out, where many even highly interested and attaining students are reluctant to pursue science and self-exclude, thinking, you know, science is not, is not for me. Um, and in addition, in the UK, there's lots of gatekeeping practices where unless young people achieve really well in the uh, early years of secondary school, there might not be a way for them to progress onto subjects that could then lead to, um, to studying a science degree. So I think that also speaks to some of the presentations that we, we had earlier where, you know, there's lots of value and there's lots of really interesting perspective that different young people bring, but the education system makes it very hard unless you are a um, high attending student to carry on with, with this subject. So, um, these are all the issues that we've been thinking about. Um, and there's many factors shaping this participation. The one I want to highlight is um, science capital, um, which is almost an umbrella term that we developed to um, capture the dispositions and science-related cultural and social capital. Um, so drawing on the work of sociologist Pierre Bourdieu. Um, and also importantly, the extent to um, which young people's resources that they do have tend to be recognized within like a main mainstream science classroom. Um, and some might be valuable, but aren't always recognized um, as, as such. The main dimensions of science capital are um, science literacy, like what you know, science attitudes and values, how you think, um, out of school science behaviors, um, what you do outside school, such as TV, um, informal STEM learning activities, and so on, and, and who, who you know. Why does science capital matter? Um, we know that students who score highly on science capital tend to be more likely to aspire to doing science in the future and see um, science as being for me, sort of having a science identity. Um, and I included a few quotes here to illustrate the difference between um, what could be seen as high and low science capital. Um, but one of the mothers says, the other day in the car, we were laughing about a chemical uh, symbols. So it does come into discussion quite subliminally, really. So science was very much part of that everyday conversation and just something that you do. Um, and another, another student said, science is just where it's at in my family. Um, what well, kind of um, as a contrasting example of this quote from one of the mothers who said, you know, I suppose in everyday life, you just don't get to do that much with clients. So it's a very different perspective and, and, and um, they shape the way young people see science as relevant for them and see that they may want to continue with it if they are if they're interested. So in our project, we think a lot about what can we do based on these 
research, which has led to a few um, research and development projects where we've been creating tools to support educators in, in challenging some of these injustices. And we argue that it's really important to not try and change the young people, but trying to change the field. Um, the field being the spaces and the power relations to which science is constructed, represented, experienced, um, what is valued and what is not, um, who has the authority to speak, whose knowledge counts, and so on. So we need to be thinking about that. Um, I would say that changing the field would, can enable more diverse young people's science capital to be recognized, valued, and leveraged, such as those experiences that I know some of the previous presenters talked about. They're very valuable, but if young people don't have opportunities to use them in a, in a science classroom, they might go un, unrecognized. And they'll help the, a diverse young people's needs to be addressed and challenge the systems, practices, and representations that include many young people from STEM and make them feel that this is not for them. Um, and it would help connect STEM more meaningfully with young people and their communities and ultimately help enact more sustainable change because you're not going to keep having to change young people, um, which has often been the focus of many initiatives funding in the UK and internationally, but trying to see how the, the wider field can be, can be changed. So I'll now move on to um, two of the tools or a tool and an approach that um, we've been using in our project. The first one is a, um, the equity compass um, that was developed to help identify, reflect on, and develop more socially just practices. Um, this compass has eight dimensions of equity, which we grouped into four overarching area. It focuses on the importance of challenging the status quo and the injustices. Um, to be equitable, practices would need to focus on serving the underserved rather than reflecting the interests, needs, and values of more privileged dominant groups. And this would include thinking about fundamental needs such as hunger and safety, um, which is an issue also in the UK. And um, transforming power relations such as between those who are more privileged and those who are less and what gets valued as STEM or science, um, including Western and Global North perspectives. Um, and thinking about redistributing resources rather than reproducing privilege. So this, this first area helps address the persistent inequalities and challenge things as they are. The next area is working with and valuing diverse communities, including shifting a focus from deficit-based, more asset-based approach where students and particularly those from underserved and underrepresented backgrounds are recognized for what for example, they do know rather than what they don't. Um, so it's really about recognizing more diverse resources, experiences, and identities. Um, and the second is about participatory working and power sharing, putting the emphasis on co-producing learning experiences together with participants rather than um, delivering this experience to them. And then the remaining two areas highlight the importance of equity being embedded throughout, for example, a school. So it's not just a passion of an individual teacher or a special project, but to be effective, it really needs to, um, to be mainstreamed um, and then extending it uh, across time and, and towards more collective outcomes. So this tool, the equity compass, can be helpful to recognize and think about different dimensions of equity. Um, help us use reflective questions to guide our thinking, consider how equitable practices and outcomes are. Um, and we've used this compass, you can kind of kind of draw a spider diagram and kind of think which are areas that perhaps you want to develop further and which are areas where you might already be doing quite um, a good job with, um, with applying equitable approach. So kind of it's useful for mapping where you are and, and mapping your progress. Um, I know this was a very brief introduction and, and I've put here links and I can put them in the chat later about a short animation we did and a, um, an insight that explains a bit more and, and gives some more guiding questions about how to use 
this tool. Um, and I'm now moving on to the next part of my talk while I focus on the science capital teaching approach. I um, also want to flag up here, we did publish a handbook um, that over um, views this, this approach and it's available as an um, ebook PDF um, for free, of course, um, from the UCL websites. And I'm going to link that in the, um, in the chat later as well. Um, the original approach was developed with um, 43 secondary um, science teachers and my colleagues at the moment working on the primary version which um, will have a handbook launched in the autumn. So if there's any primary teachers in the audience, keep an eye out. Um, I think this could be something interesting to have a look at. Um, so what's the approach about? Um, the, it's about a social justice mindset rather than new resources. And it builds on good teaching practice um, that um, TA teachers are familiar with. Um, it consists of, if you're looking at this um, graphic we got here, of an essential foundation um, and then three pillars of practice. And I'm now going to briefly talk through each of these four parts um, in the next couple of slides. So the foundation um, is about broadening what counts um, because we know that students don't just struggle with science um, concepts but strive to identify and engage with science. It feels alien to many of the students. Um, many of the students we, we work, work with tell us that. It's about challenging stereotypes and dominant ideas of representations of science, such as who does science and what constitutes doing science. Um, it's about challenging dominant idea that these subjects are for the brainiest, um, for boys, for white people, and, and, and so on. Um, and it's also useful to ask questions such as who and what sort of behaviors tend to get valued as who's a good science student um, or what does it mean to be good at science. Um, and within this approach, the um, four um, main areas are um, tailoring to the least engaged students in the class, starting with the students, so really kind of thinking about their experiences, their existing knowledge, and how they might relate to the science that is being taught. Uh, leveling the playing field um, where students who do not have certain resources are not necessarily disadvantaged and um, really wider ways of doing science. Um, and finally, support voice and agency of, of the students. So create the classroom environment where student voices can be heard and um, validated. The um, first pillar is personalizing and localizing. Um, and the aim of this is to reduce the distance between science and student lives to make it more meaningful and relevant to them. And we know that a lot of teachers are very good at contextualizing science, drawing in real life examples, but this might not necessarily be meaningful and relevant to specific students in the class. Um, so it's the first step that's important is really getting to know students. Um, and this approach would look different in, in every classroom because students are different and teaching in a urban school in a big city would probably mean that students have quite different interests if a comparison to students that might live somewhere more rurally, um, or there's other factors that play a role. And I've got a quote here from one of our partner teachers um, who said, if kids can talk about their experience, express themselves for their ideas, I find they're far more engaged and they're valued a lot more. When they're talking about something that they personally know and care about, you can see that they're happy and just more excited to to participate and engage in the classroom. Um, the next pillar is meaningfully elicit value and link. Um, so this is about a way to support students to feel valued and connected to, to science, where teachers would elicit students' experiences, skills, and home knowledge. So again, kind of broadening what sort of knowledge, skills, resources, experiences do have place in the in the classroom and uh, explicitly valuing and recognizing this and and linking them to to science um, and the third pillar is 
building science capital, so drawing on, on some of our work that as well as recognizing the resources that students do have um, that is worthwhile to actively cultivate, develop, and build science capital dimensions. And some parts of science capital, like scientific knowledge is of course part of, of most science lessons, but there are others that are not that frequently addressed, such as um, knowledge about the transferability of science, that science is useful for many jobs, not just jobs in science, um, teachers encouraging um, science engagement outside of school, um, um, family science skills, knowledge and qualifications, just highlighting that, for example, lots of parents may be using science skills in their day-to-day -day work, even if they might not necessarily think about a job as being like kind of a typical science job. Um, and highlighting um, knowing people in science related roles and talking about science in everyday life. We, we have evidence um, that the approach worked. We did um, pre and post surveys with the students where we've been um, implementing the approach in the UK. We found that more students plan to engage further with science and the science capital scores increased and students also mentioned that they talked to more to others about science, engage with science online and did things like going for a walk in, in the nature. So to sum up the main points, um, it's really important thinking about not just what you do, but the way you do it. So it might not necessarily be a particular activity um, like doing more hands-on stuff, but it's really about thinking what is underpinning that activity. What are the, um, I'm taking for granted, assumption, are you involving the young people in, in any of these learning experiences? Do you have an asset-based approach and, and, and so on? So it's really about the why, or it's a bit of a type of that, why and the how of, of doing things. So it's the underpinning values and the mindset that will determine the equitable potential of, of the practice. Um, and as I said before, the focus needs to be on changing the field and not, and not the young person. And this can be sometimes, doing this can be sometimes quite, quite challenging because we, we found in working now for a couple of years with teachers and educators in informal STEM learning spaces like museums, um, zoos, coding club, and so on, that reflecting on equity and reflecting on your own privilege can be challenging and can be uncomfortable, um, particularly addressing privilege in relation to, um, to race, um, also in relation to gender and class. So there really needs to be time and support for teachers to be able to reflect and, and develop that equitable practice. Um, and I just put at the end um, links to our projects if people are interested to, uh, to learn more. And thank you very much for your, for your attention.